one of the absolute best ways to grow as a leader is to find a coach who will not only encourage you, but who will challenge you, inspire you, and pull out the greatness inside of you. Whether you're looking for a leadership coach, a communication coach, or a life coach, Speak With People has options for you. Make sure you check out speakwithpeople.com slash coaching, and let's schedule a discovery call today and pull out the greatness that you have. Welcome to the Speak With People podcast. My name is Jason Rates. I'll be your host, and this podcast exists to help you improve your communication skills. Whether you communicate one-on-one to a team, from a stage, or from behind a screen, we know that when we improve our communication skills as leaders, it exponentially changes everything. It improves our relationships, it improves our leadership skills, and it improves our business skills. So let's get ready to dive into this next episode. Well, how does a Major League Baseball player deal with both the positive and the negative communication, critique, and reviews that come along their way during their career? What has to happen in their development to be able to focus and dwell on everything that is said about them? Why is it so important as a leader to learn how to communicate, especially when they're coaching their team or younger leaders? And what dynamics are most important when it comes to coaching youth? Well, today I am so excited to have a phenomenal guest on the Speak With People podcast. He is a former Major League Baseball player. He is a dad. He's a youth coach. He works with the Cleveland Guardians. He does a ton in his community. Uh, Travis, welcome to the Speak With People podcast. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, Jay. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. Well, hey, before we before we hop in, I thought maybe you could tell our listeners a little bit more about your story what got you to this place? You know, what are uh, some of the highs and the lows? A little bit more about your family, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Uh, I grew up on a farm in North Dakota, so really small town. Um, I was uh, top 10 in my class, very gifted academically. Um, there was only eight kids in my class, but I still made the top 10. Uh, went to a junior college in southern Kansas, played baseball there for two years. Uh, got drafted by the Texas Rangers spent five and a half years in the minor leagues and then i got called up to the big leagues with texas i got traded to cleveland for played there for 10 years uh finished my career with the yankees and uh have been like a special assistant with the uh, guardians now for several years um been married for 17 years to my beautiful wife amy we have three boys uh blake Tripp and knox who are 14 11 and 8 and they're all into baseball and um they keep us busy. So that's kind of the uh, quick 30 second rundown. Absolutely. Abs- so North Dakota. Wow. Winters probably were pretty decent there. Yeah. I mean, we were just, we were just talking about it. Um, when you live in Florida, you forget that there is winter. Right. Um, you forget that there's snow. Um, but man, <laughs> we had some, I mean, there would be times where the windshield would get to like minus 50 and, you know, sometimes you're just driving along and there's snow going, you know, blowing sideways and it's so flat up there. Like you you can't see anything when you're driving. It's, uh, winters aren't very fun for driving. That's for sure. Wow. So how, how did someone from a small town make it all the way to the major leagues? I mean, what a, what a great, awesome story. I mean, I think about the parents nowadays who are, you know, and, and I, I coached all of my kids, little league teams, but you know, I mean, they're, they're traveling state to state to state. They, some parents are even hiring, you know, private coaches and trainers, right. you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that wasn't what your childhood was like. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we just, we just played whatever sport it was. Obviously like, like we didn't have a ton of numbers, so, uh, we just played the sport. So I did uh, basketball track baseball. Um, but, but baseball was my first love. And then I was fortunate to get into a junior college down in Kansas and play year round and had some just phenomenal coaches and um, the Burroughs brothers. And they really kind of helped me develop and grow and have a chance to play professionally. Wow. That that is just phenomenal. What were the years in the minors like? I'm a giant spring training baseball fan. So I I would even sometimes take uh, spring training games over a regular season game, unless it's probably the playoffs or World Series. I just love the atmosphere of spring training. When I go to a game, of course, we both live in, in a great area in Florida where there are, right. you know, 
parks near each other. I love to go early. I love to listen and watch. What were those years like? Was it uh, difficult? Was it? Did you, were there moments where you thought, "Oh my goodness, I, I, I'm I may never get out of the the minors," or you know, <laughs> did you know like, "No, th- this year's the year." <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, you get the the whole gambit. Um, in general, there's this um, kind of feeling like how brutal the minor leagues are like you're paying your dues it's just the worst place ever but I remember I remember kind of getting there and after two weeks uh didn't have to go to class played baseball every day for like seven hours and then at the end of two weeks I got like a paycheck for 800 bucks and I was like this is the best (laughs) thing ever and uh you know like even the eight hour bus trips from Georgia to Maryland like it's fun you're hanging out with your buddies you're yep um, you're watching movies and I really enjoyed it. It was fun playing in, in these like really nice stadiums. You get a couple thousand people there and, um, it's kind of fun to work your ladder up. I think the frustration that might be when, you know, you're not moving up as fast as you think you should. Um, you know, but that's just part of paying your dues and making sure that you're ready. Yep. So in, in what phase or stage of your career, and maybe it was as early on in high school, I, I, I don't know. But when you started to deal with, you know, having to learn how to drown out the negative voices, the negative things being said about you, I mean, leaders, right, when we step into leadership, you know, we're asking for it because we're out front and all that. But I mean, as a player, you're trying to, you know, hone your skills and do all that kind of stuff. And then everybody else has an opinion, you know, how, how did you learn how to work through that? When did it, when did that first start? You first started to realize, wow, okay, I'm being watched and everyone kind of has an opinion about what I'm doing. <laughs> um, certainly once you get to the big leagues, uh, everything is under a microscope. Um, it was actually like one of the things that I noticed, like my first big league at bat, I got called up and you look out to center field and you're like, there was like five TV cameras right there. Uh, <laughs> so you're like, we probably have like a million people watching this game. Um, you know, so certainly, you know, sports reporters get paid to have opinions and typically negativity will sell more than, you know, being positive or right. things like that. So, um, you know, you really kind of just got to focus on your process. And that it's, it's one of the reasons that's that the clubhouse gets to be very tight knit because you feel like, a little bit of like it's us against you know it's uh, it's us against everybody so like we got to believe in each other we got to believe in ourselves what whatever's being said on the outside doesn't really impact us and you know yep. sometimes you can use it as motivation more than anything yeah oh that's so good and that's so applicable especially for teams in the workplace you know i mean even for families i mean with how uh, communication works. One of my uh, favorite, well, my favorite baseball player of all time, uh, Ted Williams. So, you know, played Boston Red Sox, you know, uh, late 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. I mean, he like you read all his biographies. I mean, <laughs> the, the press, they just went after him and he was awful to the press. I mean, he said horrible things. There's a famous story of him spitting at the crowd once. Because, I mean, he just, so he went the exact opposite, you know, like, you know, dove into that. Did you come across any players in your time where, you know, they just, yeah, they, they kind of, they kind of leaned into that negativity with negativity a little bit? Well, you know, there's some really good Ted Williams stories (laughs) since since you brought him up. But as a kid, like I really didn't have like hitting instructors or anything. So I had like the science of hitting by Ted Williams and I would just read that. And that was like my hitting, my hitting guide. Um, but I remember when you get to Fenway Park, there is this red seat out in right field, which is allegedly where Ted Williams hit like this farthest home run. And like in batting practice, you would hit a ball as far as you could, and it would be 30 rows away from that. And you're like, hey, I know I hit that ball pretty good. Like, I don't know how realistic that is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I forgot now. I was rambling on about Ted Williams, and I forgot your question. No, it's so good. But just did you come across any of the players, you know, that kind of took Ted's angle a little bit? (laughs) Yeah. So not really personally, I would say, but definitely like I'm a fan of watching, um, you know, like the the Michael Jordan biography that came out. And it just seemed like, man, he remembered everything negative anybody ever (sighs) said. And he just used that as fuel. And even, you know, even when they're giving their Hall of Fame speeches, you know, he's you could tell it's still bothers him to this day. So, um, 
I was never, I was never like that to a point, but yeah. Um, you know, I guess it's whatever can motivate you to, yep. to be at your best. Um, well, I grew up uh, in Detroit, and so uh, Ann Arbor is not far. And uh, number 12, uh, you know, TB12 was the quarterback of the University of Michigan Wolverines. And, you know, the amount of times I've heard him talk about number 199, you know, it sure did. It sure did fuel him to, uh, to uh, keep going. I mean, just, I mean, so powerful. Well. well Yep. Give us what was one of the favorite moments that you had in your career? I mean, I mean, you had a, a, a long career. What was one of the those moment stories that just stood out as, man, I, I, I wish I could relive that moment? Yeah, um, I would say from an individual standpoint, um, I just remember like tying the, the major league record for grand slams in a season. And it's almost just like it's almost surreal in the moment, just like, right. Holy cow, like. Like I actually am tied for a major league record. Like I can't believe it. Like this yep. is a minor miracle. Um, but but without a doubt, I would say from a team standpoint, uh, I only made the playoffs one time. So our one time in the playoffs, it was it was incredible. Like I mean, uh, the intensity like on every pitch was like I'd never seen before. And then uh, we we're actually able to beat the Yankees in the first round in Yankee Stadium, given like very little chance to do that. Um, right. But certainly like having the dog pile at Yankee Stadium was something that I'll never forget. Man, I mean, going into the dark side. Right. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's right. that's that's just incredible. And I'm you know, I get in trouble all the time because I'll show up. Uh, I volunteer with a youth group as a small group leader and I'll have on a Yankee hat, or I'll have on a Blue Jays hat or a Tigers hat. And I'll get in trouble. They're like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, I'm a I'm a baseball fan. You know, I. I love it, but that must have been, you know, just absolutely incredible to do that. So, does does your Grand Slam record still hold? Then, yeah, I'm tied with uh, Don Mattingly with six. <laughs> I think I think it's six. Because, um, but I, actually, I got up with the bases loaded with a month left in the season and got hit in the hand and broke my hand. So, you know, you figure you might have had another four or five at bat. So, who knows? You know, if it could have happened, but oh. I'm really thankful to 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 have a part of that record absolutely absolutely not so bad to be mentioned in the same vein with Don Mattingly <laughs> absolutely it's uh you know it's grand slams are yeah I don't want to say that they're fluky but you know you only get 20 25 at bats a season with the bases loaded so everything kind of has to line up really good and and of course, I mean the the article I read and and this was from last year I mean you're the first to hit uh, what was it? Uh, five before the all-star break? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was just one of those years that, uh, when I got up with the bases loaded, just for whatever reason, I hit some home runs <laughs> during that, you know, and it's, I would say like the majority of time when you're up there hitting, like if you try to hit home runs, uh, only bad things are going to happen very right. rarely. Very rarely would you go up there and say, I'm going to hit a home run and then do it. Um, but if you try to hit a home run, you would strike out or pop up or hit a weak ground ball. And you're like, oh, okay, I got to get back to a good approach. Yep. Um, but I remember too, just, you know, after a few home runs, like you're getting close and you're like, bases are loaded. I'm trying to go deep and you would, you would hit a home run is kind of amazing. <laughs> I can't, I can't even imagine how, how incredible I grew up. Yeah. I read everything, you know, read the science of hitting, went through the whole deal, everything Ted Williams. I was always, you know, I loved his quote, you know, I want to be, you know, known as the greatest hitter of all time. You know, look, there goes Ted Williams, the greatest. And I loved one of the uh, articles I read once the, the news reporter asked him, you know, what's it like having all this God given ability, you know, to be this incredible. And he's like, well, if, you know, swinging the baseball bat a thousand times a day, <laughs> you know, is a, is a, is my God given ability, you know, then, <laughs> than something else, but you must have seen it. I mean, you know, today's world and maybe it's always been this way, but maybe with technology and how quick everything is and we're able to get information, people want things tomorrow. You know, what advice would you give to leaders, especially as you're, you know, you're, you're in a system, you're trying to learn your craft. You want it all to happen tomorrow. What advice would you give them to kind of hang in there and, and, you know, just be patient and keep going? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you really have to enjoy the process. Like, it's very easy to be results-driven. Um, 
you know, you, you hear like Nick Saban talk about it in football all the time, but you know, like part of what makes people really good is they really love their work and they really love the grind. And, you know, they, they like putting in the practice hours and they kind of know that like, this is where I make my money, like in the grind and in the practice and in the fundamentals and just kind of perfecting these things. So, you know, if, if all you want to do is hit home runs and you want the doubles, like it's going to be really tough to get there and probably won't happen. But if you really enjoy like the hours in the batting cage and like the, the talking with the coach and making adjustments and looking at film, like it's going to happen like through hard work and like good quality work. I can't even imagine. Uh, my dad and I went to a Tigers game last week out in Lakeland and our kids, uh, my kids had got us tickets for Christmas and we walked into the stadium and every single time, you know, I don't know what it is with me, but you know, I'm, I'm starting to cry. I'm like, Oh my goodness, this is, this is the best thing. What a, what a gift and a joy it must've been to be able to walk into those stadiums uh, every day. How, how did you not take it for granted when you were there? How did you, you know, I know, I love what you just talked about. I mean, that's such amazing advice to leaders loving the grind, you know, in it, but I'm sure there was probably moments where you're like, okay, you know, how, how am I going to get through this? <laughs> what advice would you give? Right. I mean, uh, you know, an athletic career can be like so short lived. I, I mean, there's just so much competition, so many people, um, in the levels, um, right behind you that want your job. So, you know, I think someone kind of told me a, a quote sometime, like play today, like it's your last day. Cause you never know, like there's, there's injuries, freak things happen. So, you know, it's really kind of just trying to stay in the moment and be like, okay, I'm going to give my best effort today. Um, and, you know, kind of having that be your focus as opposed to like, you know, worrying about external things that you can't control, but I can control my effort and my attitude today and go out there and do the best you can. Yep. Oh, I love that. I love that. We uh, we were sitting there, and I turned around, and uh, Jim Leland was sitting right behind me. And I'm like, okay, this is fun. <laughs> Jim Leland was, was great. I love oh. Jim Leland. <laughs> I can't imagine. So speaking of coaches, who is your favorite in terms of how they communicated? I'm sure you had all different coaches who communicated in different ways, you know, either harsh or soft or, you know, however, what, what type of communication from a coach really resonated with how you were wired? Yeah, that's a good question. And you, you kind of hit on it. I had, um, you know, my college coach was very intense, um, off the field. He was like a father figure, you could talk to anything about him, but on the field, he was like very intense. Um, and then in my professional career, I was really drawn to uh, like batting coaches because you'd spend, you know, one to two hours a day in the batting cage talking with them. So you develop those really good relationships. And, um, you know, the batting coaches I really liked uh, made the process fun. Like, like I, I look to go into the cage every day because – you know, even if we didn't get anything accomplished baseball wise, we were going to have a fun time, you know? So I think finding that happy zone of like, Hey, we're getting our work in, we're getting better, but we're also really enjoying it. Like, you know, it's okay to like have fun and really enjoy what you're doing. And like, that's going to make you want to work even harder. So, um, I think I was really drawn to like the positivity, but you know, it can't just be like positive with nothing behind it. There was like good information, you know? So just, you know, that happy place of like, we're positive, we're getting better, we're working hard, but you know, we're having a good time in the process. Yeah. Yeah. How many coaches did you have in, in your time in Cleveland? Uh, two managers and probably four hitting coaches. Okay. And so you spend probably most of your time with the hitting coaches? Yeah. I mean, you would, uh, you know, the different coaches in different areas, like infield coach, managers, stuff like that. But, you know, you, 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 you do a lot of individual time in the cages out on the field for batting practice with your, with your hitting coaches. Yeah. Does, did your team or uh, does the major league, do they do anything to equip players with communication skills when, you know, all of a sudden reporters are putting microphones in front of your face and then they want to know what you think about this or, did, or was it just sort of you're on your own and you had to figure out how to how to answer the right way? <laughs> There's gonna be 30 reporters coming up to you like good luck, Andy. You know, it's uh, <laughs> w w when they believe that you're gonna make your uh, uh, big league debut or even like in the minor leagues, but definitely like in spring training and stuff, they'll they'll have somebody. Uh, usually, it's like a former media, maybe even present day media that will come and 
you know, just give you some advice of, you know, things to watch out for, things not to say, kind of just making you very aware of yes. how powerful your words are. Sometimes they'll ask you a question, you know, like, do you think your manager should get fired? And if you Oof. say like, no, I don't, I don't think my manager should get fired. They try to put those words in your mouth. So the comment appears kind of negative. Um, so, so typically they would do a really good job every year of having you be prepared. And if, if something during the year came up that was like, Ooh, this is going to be an issue. Then they would get you together and kind of talk through like, Hey, this is probably the, a good way to respond to this. It's right. So important. I mean, can you imagine, I mean, you know, for, for a lot of our listeners, they work in a workplace where ev- probably everybody has come across that one coworker who's always trying to get you to flub up your words or say something yeah. you didn't mean. I mean, yeah. So having those skills to be able to deal with that is just so important. When it came to your teammates, uh, what were the, I mean, maybe some of the, the skills you tried to live out when it came, came to communicating with them or what were some of the best practices you saw in other teammates that, you know, communicated the best. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think one of the best things that I heard was you want to build relationships with guys, um, before you just start, you know, giving them like quote unquote feedback, Mm. you know? So like if, if there was a situation that came up or somebody didn't hustle hard to first base, you know, rather than the first time I go talk to this kid and just say like, Hey, we got to run hard. You know, you're representing the team. You got to run hard. That's gonna not. That's not gonna be received very well because the only thing he's ever heard from me was me getting on him. Right. But you know, if I if if I've spent like you know spring training and you know the first months of the season like getting to know him, like he knows that I like legitimately care and love for him. Like then if I if I come to him and say something like, "Hey, that that wasn't a good look. We need to you know tighten that up." It's gonna be received a lot better because I've established a relationship and that yes. I care about him. Oh. I mean, so foundational. I mean, that's I mean, imagine how many leaders would, uh, how many folks would uh, not have the headaches that probably they've experienced if they built the trust first with their coworkers. Yeah, that's such an important. Yeah, thing. That's, yeah, that's that's you know foundational, a big part of it, and something yep. that helped me tremendously. Yep. Uh, sorry to geek out just a little bit more, but who was the toughest uh, pitcher you faced in your career? So I would say, um, obviously, like all of the big name guys and the guys that are always in the running for best pitchers are all really, really good. It did seem like when people would have a Cy Young year, they were just even that much sharper where you would have at bats where you might not get a pitch to hit. They were just locating their breaking balls on the outside corner and things like that. So, you know, Verlander was very good. Johan Santana. Uh, Mariano Rivera just felt like he never gave me a pitch to hit ever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, there's so many that are, that are tough. And what, what's, what's great about the big leagues too, is like, they might bring in a left-handed reliever to face you and he's got like a six ERA and you go up there thinking, you know, this is fresh meat. I'm going to destroy this. And like, you can't pick the ball up off him and you know, everybody's hitting him, but for whatever reason, like you can't pick it, pick up his slider or the just, you know, you can't see him for whatever reason. So, um, it was literally every at bat, uh, was a challenge and well, kind of to the point as well. I remember getting called up and facing someone who didn't have great numbers and you watch him on TV and you're like, Oh man, I would, I would do really well off this guy. And you get up there and you're like, Holy cow, this is a really good changeup. Like maybe the best <laughs> changeup I've ever faced. Yep. <laughs> you know, so it just, uh, That's what was great about it is, you know, you're facing the best pitchers in the world and they're all different. They all attack you differently. They all got different strengths and weaknesses, release points, how you see it. So it's uh, righties, lefties, different arm angles. It's 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 a tremendous challenge. Did you ever get a chance? I can't remember when interplay uh, came in, but did you ever get a chance to uh, go up against Greg Maddox? Yeah, I did. uh, I believe he was in either Chicago or San Diego or maybe both. So it's uh it's impressive. Like you're facing him, and it's, you know, you're, you're not blown away by his stuff. It's not like, right. You know, you just get up there and he's blowing your doors off, but it's just like, everything's on the corner. If it misses, it's off the plate. Again, there's nothing really good to hit. And you kind of got to go up there with an approach of, I'm going to try to hit the ball the other way or take a single. Like it's those guys that do a really good job of keeping it in the ballpark. Cause you don't get a whole lot to hit. Right. 
Right. So many movies where the catcher is playing mind games with the, with the batter. Is that is that real in Major League Baseball? Are they allowed to like, you know, do that or uh, not so much? Some guys would do it a little bit. Um, and, it, it, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be like in the movie Major League or something right. like those <laughs> conversations. But there were some catchers that would just chat you up the whole at bat. And you're kind of like, can you please be quiet? Like I'm trying to... <laughs> I'm trying to focus in right or, or there were certain guys that just were talking with the umpire the whole time so like you're up there hitting and in the background is just this this conversation of the catcher and the umpire <laughs> and it was so annoying uh. you know but <laughs> I, I think that was probably the best ploy is like let me just talk and try to have a conversation yep. with him while he's hitting and it's yep you know it was very distracting what what was it like uh when you went from i mean so many years with cleveland and now now you're with New York. I mean, was that a, I mean, was that like a, I mean, you got to spend a, a good chunk of time with one city, you know, was that a, a real tough thing for you and your family? Was it exciting because it was New York? You know, how did that go down for you? Yeah, kind of all of the above. I mean, I was, I was really comfortable in Cleveland. It's like, you know, everybody there, you know, yeah, like everybody in the building. And all of a sudden you're going to a place where, you know, a couple guys on the team, you know, but it's, it's just kind of learning a whole, a whole new group of people. And, uh, you, you, I had heard a lot of stories about New York media, how tough that was going to be. Um, growing up in North Dakota, like I was, you know, when, when we would go to New York, I kind of just stayed in my hotel room. Like I didn't get out a whole lot. The city was, uh, it was a huge city. So, yeah. you know, a little out of my comfort zone there. So those are some things to think about, but then at the same time, I'm like, you know, they always have really good teams and it's a really good, park for for right-handed hitters and you know it's it's going to be good for me to get out of my comfort zone a little bit and try something new and grow and um you know overall like I had a really good experience there yeah yeah what was uh Derek Jeter like he was incredible uh there are guys that you, you know you hear good things about and then you, when you see him in person you're kind of like yeah this isn't the real deal but Derek Jeter uh I don't think I've ever seen anybody that had as much demand for his time like everybody wanted his time and he just handled it like seamlessly he yeah he was he was so good at managing his time he was very personal with everybody again like he knew all all the clubhouse workers I mean I guess he's there for so long but he he treated everybody great like he was wow. he was like a legit leader ah, I love it I love it so turn it turn it quarters a little bit you know youth sports is just I mean life for many 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 families, you know, and so, uh, uh, you, you now are on the, you know, the other end where, you know, you, you were able to experience it all and now you've got boys playing, you know, what's that like being on the other end, you know, or do you ever find yourself just going, this is so much fun or do you find yourself going, you know, falling into the traps of maybe, you know, trying to, you know, not enjoy it as much as possible because you, you can see, because you've already been there, you can see it all. Yeah. Um, w w when I'm when I'm coaching baseball or watching baseball, I, c I can view my kids as like the lens of, you know, I've seen two, three thousand baseball games in my life. Like, I know it's like a very slow developmental journey, and like after every game, we can kind of talk through stuff. But you know, if we were to do like flag football or basketball, it's like you know what your kids should do, and they're not <laughs> they're not doing it. And you're kind of like. Like, like I want to be the guy that like yells like, Hey, move your feet, you know, just whatever that looks like. But, um, it's such a good opportunity for kids to just grow through sports. Um, the successes and the failures, being good teammates, learning how to work hard. Um, there's so much that can be learned there. So sometimes it can be frustrating when, you know, parents live and die with every pitch or every play and they get, they get too crazy into it and they, they don't allow like the kids to learn from their mistakes. Yes. Yes. Do you, are you, do you, do you have any concerns for the future of youth, uh, youth baseball, especially? So when I, I coached, boy, I, uh, I, I probably, uh, eight years of little league teams. My boys were five, you know, all the way up and then they broke my heart and decided to, uh, not play anymore. But, um, yeah. you know, I had, you know, probably about a half in that time, a half dozen, really yucky moments where parents are like you just said living and dying in every right. pitch screaming at the 13 or 15 year old umpire like you know they are do you have any of those moments where you're like oh this is going in a or do you do you have 
you know, genuine uh, positivity for the future of it that, you know, parents will be okay. Because you, you, you see those stories sometimes of the, you know, the umps being just, or parents going at each other. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know that parents are going to change anytime soon. <laughs> it, in fact, it almost seems to be getting like a little more intense as we go. Um, you know, you, you see parents taking their kids to lessons several times a week. They're working out and training at nine, 10 years old. So, yep. you know, they're kind of missing out on the experience to kind of have fun and enjoy it. Like it's almost becoming like a job at nine and 10 when that stuff should be a little bit later on. Right. Um, right. And, you know, being in Florida, like one of the dangers is we can play year round. Um, so they're not getting proper rest. They're not allowed to play other sports. Um, they're yep. not allowed to, you know, just kind of be a kid and have fun, which is good too. So, um, growing up in North Dakota, like I could only play two months out of the year that it wasn't snowing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, definitely here in Florida, like teams are lifting earlier. Like they have team lifts in eighth and ninth grade. And it's, you know, it just, it's getting like more and more serious at a younger age, which, you know, has its pluses and minuses, but, um, the game always survives. It always keeps going. Yeah. Uh, any advice to those parents who, you know, they find themselves at games getting feistier and feistier and feistier, you know, any, any communication advice you just say to them? I mean, you know, parent, it's okay for parents to cheer and all that, but there's just that certain yep. level of parent who's, you know, they're coaching from the stands, they're screaming from the stands, you know, any advice to them? Yeah. J just sit back and watch the game and enjoy it for good or bad. And just kind of know, like, you know, you screaming like can under can undercut the coach. Like maybe the coach is saying like, Hey, I'm working on this and you're screaming this. Now your yep. son is confused. Um, your kid strikes out on a pitch, questionable pitch on the outside corner and you're blowing up the umpire. You're embarrassing your kid. But at the same time, like don't tell your kid that, Hey, that's a ball. You don't swing at that. Let your kid make an adjustment. Yep. Hey, this is the way the umpire is calling it today. I got to make an adjustment. And there has to be accountability. So I think when the parents are like overactive and, you know, everything with my son is perfect, he's not doing anything wrong. You really miss the opportunity to make right. adjustments and learn what accountability is, you know? So, uh, when I coach, I typically don't, I don't let my kids talk about the umpires at all. Like the calls are the calls. Yep. Uh, we're not going to lose a game because an umpire made a bad call. We're going to lose a game because we didn't play well enough. Right. 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 What, what, what kind of, as, as a coach, when you're, I mean, you have such, uh, I mean, such a great opportunity to mold, to speak truth into, you know, youth's lives, into their minds. What kind of approaches do you take as you, you know, speak one-on-one -on -one to each of your players, as you speak to the team, uh, you know, which, what are some steps you take to be able to do that uh, in, a, in a healthy way? Yeah, so I try to, have, you know, like we talked about earlier, develop good relationships with all the kids. Yeah. When they walk, when they walk in uh, through the gate, hey, how you doing? How you know how's school been? You know, and just I want to make it like a very fun environment. I want the kids to like love coming to practice. Um, and then I try to give like really clear vision on everything. Like you know, granted there is like a little bit of you know variance, but this is how we this is how we hit. These are the mechanics. These are the approach. This is how we field ground balls and kind of like give out very clear vision, talk a lot about being good teammates. And this is the way that we're going to treat each other. These yep. are things that aren't allowed. Um, so, so eventually like, you know, once the kids have played for me for a little bit, they kind of know what to expect. It's going to be a very positive environment. We're going to be good teammates. We're going to be ultra competitive and, um, you know, just try to get the most out of our ability and develop. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's not about winning trophies. It's, you know, development. And I really want the kids to love the game of baseball, you know? So at the end of the season, I wanted to be like, Oh man, I can't believe the season's over. I can't wait when we start back up. Yep. Yep. Oh, and that just, that just speaks to culture building because we've both probably been in, you know, organizations or teams where, you know, the culture wasn't as healthy as it could be. I mean, and it, it, you know, Every once in a while, there's just that, even if there's just a little bit of toxicity, one team member, one player who brings that toxic attitude, what's some of your, 
your thoughts or advice, you know, as a, as team members to be able to, you know, everybody's recognizing that toxicity, right. You know, again, you know, how do you, how do you help pull that out of them? <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot of times that's just having like tough conversations, like, um, with the kid or the parent or both Yep. and just kind of like letting them know what expectations are and, Hey, these are the, this, this is the way that we're going to run the ship. And if you're not on board with that, or you completely disagree with that, Hey, I totally get it. And, you know, maybe this isn't the team for you, but, um, mm. you know, the, the kids on my team are going to, or the kids and the parents on my team are going to follow to some basic standards, um, which helps create a good environment where we can grow. Yeah. Oh, Boy, that's so good. That's so good. Well, our time has flown by, and I could probably ask you another 100 questions, but you, I mean, you really have given us some really great gold and some wisdom, especially with team building and communication. Uh, so I really appreciate it. I, I did want to ask, just from your Cleveland, uh, I, I get a lot of hate over the years because I'm in the camp that probably would pick LeBron over Michael. I know I know it's just kind of crazy, uh, and I don't know if there was, you know, since you lived in Cleveland, if there's something you had to sign that says, you know, LeBron. But uh, <laughs> do you, do, you know, we, we talked about Michael earlier. Do you think players from that that genre, I think of, you know, players like LeBron's from the 2000s and up had to deal with a level of scrutiny on social media that that generation, the 90s, 80s, you know, and down, I mean, yes, the media have always been the media, you know, as we saw with, we talked about with Ted Williams, but now, I mean, everywhere they go is on video, everything is a scene, you know, do you think those older generations could have, could have been as, as successful as they were if they, you know, had all that scrutiny, or do you think you just kind of, you know, each generation figures it out as they go? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, even even when I played, which was oh two through thirteen, um, I didn't have any social media. Um, we did, we just kind of had papers or you know the internet or whatever that you could go on and look. But in general, like I tried to stay away from it as much as I could and just kind of focus on what I could control. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, like you're you're kind of encouraged to have uh, yeah all the social medias to to kind of grow your brand and you have you know, marketing deals or it gets your name out there, it gets you more popular and that's considered like a good thing. So, you know, it'd be really tough to have social media accounts and not read what people are saying to you. Like, you know, I'm sure they get tons of negative comments. Um, so it's just a different level of yeah. uh, scrutiny. Everything is like up to the, up to the second instantaneous. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of glad that I wasn't playing uh, in this era. Like, there's such a demand for, you know, access to the players and yep. all of that stuff. So, um, you know, just, just having sports reporters and a newspaper uh, probably is not much compared to what it is today. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, before I let you go, we, we do rapid-fire questions with our guests. We're building a communication and leadership skills library. It sounds really awesome. It is. It's just a Google spreadsheet, but we put everybody's recommendations on there, and uh, it's a growing it's a growing list. So, uh, we talk a lot about speakers on this podcast. Do you personally have a favorite speaker that just every time you hear them, boy, they just fill you up? Uh, you would recommend them to someone else. So I know this is lightning round, but there's a lot of pressure here if it goes on some document that people are reading. Um, <laughs> So I actually like to drive in my car and I listen to um, like a lot of just sermons from yep. different different pastors that I really like. And Craig Rochelle is is one of my favorites. Um, he's fantastic on leadership and yes. he has like so many good things to say, some great books. So I would yeah, say he's, him. he's amazing. Absolutely. Is there a, a podcast or a YouTube channel that's either guilty pleasure or on the development end that Every, every episode, you're just like, ooh, this this fills me up. Hmm. <laughs> now I just feel like I'm going to answer Craig Rochelle to everything. <laughs> no, I love it. <laughs> no, he has a really good podcast. Um, you know, I, I do listen to like some uh, some sports stuff as well. But um, yeah, in general, it's like my YouTube and podcast probably, probably run the same. Like I don't really yeah. listen to a ton of podcasts, but like 
on YouTube, I do. So, yep, yep, I love it. Is there a book that you would recommend? Hey, every leader, you you've really got to you got to read this book. Hmm, that's a good one. I I would say um, I would say like ninety nine percent of my reading would be the Bible, and I yep. kind of just really enjoy how Jesus approached leadership as yep. far as you know being a servant leader. And one thing that was really cool about Jesus is he asked a lot of questions. So kind of getting to the why of why people are doing things. And I think when you ask questions to people, it, they kind of start pulling out their own answers and then it becomes something that they own rather than you telling them something. So, yes. I mean, that was, that's something I love that the power of the question. I love that. Travis, I can't thank you enough. Like really appreciate your time. I know this conversation is going to be a great uh, benefit to our, our listeners, uh, our audience. And so we just really appreciate you sharing your wisdom and your story. Uh, just love it. Thank you. Yeah, this was fantastic. I appreciate you having me on, Jason. This was, this was amazing. Absolutely. Uh, is there anywhere online that you want us to send people to find out more about you? No. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's fantastic. I love it. I, I, don't really, I don't really have much as far as social media, so... I'm boring, I guess. No, no, not at all. I, I think that's a fantastic answer. I love it. Well, thank you for joining us on another episode of the Speak With People podcast. We hope that you were encouraged. We hope that you were inspired and challenged to improve your communication skills. I want to thank you again for being a part of the Speak With People podcast community. Make sure you don't miss out on being a part of the Speak With People Facebook community group. Just head to Facebook, type in Speak With People, scroll down and join our community because every single day we're encouraging each other, we're helping each other to improve our communication skills. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next episode.